thank you very much, Corey, and thank you, John, and thank you for the opportunity to spend some time with you. Uh, I very much appreciate uh, the tremendous uh, experience that I've had over the 13 years that I've been president. Uh, I, I decided in my first year that I would conduct an ongoing provincial tour for the years of my service as president, and that has brought me to the cities and towns of Saskatchewan on a regular basis. It's been an experience that I cherished. I've learned an enormous amount from the provincial tour. This is really the last day in the 13 years of my provincial tour. So uh, in that sense, it is, uh, it is uh, noteworthy uh, for me personally. So thank you again for the opportunity to speak at the Chamber. The, the leaders that I know of the Regina community who are in this room join the leaders in the Chambers right across uh, the province in celebrating, I think, the circumstances of our province and the opportunities that are available in our province and the prospects for our province. And so. Uh, we're all in this together, and I think that's, uh, that's a very exciting feature of life in our province uh, at this time. I do want to uh, indicate that a number of my colleagues from the university are here, the University of Saskatchewan, and I'm going to mention them. Uh, Grit McCree is a member of our Board of Governors. She's a former member of our Senate. She is, of course, a graduate of the university. She lives in Calgary, but she lives, too, in Saskatoon, as she will tell you, because, you know, members of the boards of these universities, the University of Regina, the University of Saskatchewan, perform enormously important public service. And there's no glory in it, and there's no money in it. It truly is public service. And Rick McCree is a spectacular example of that, both as a member of our Senate and as a member of our Board of Governors, the contributions that she makes along with her board colleagues to uh, the oversight of the university's affairs and activities. That's a big tremendous Immediately to uh, to Grit's right is Ernie Barber, uh, the Dean of Engineering. Uh, Ernie, a long-standing, very distinguished member of the University of Saskatchewan faculty and administrative team. He's one of the few people I know and can imagine who has served as a dean both of agriculture and of engineering, because he's, a, he's an agricultural engineer. And so he uh, he covers both disciplines. Right now, it's engineering and uh, and uh, great to here as well. Next to him, Charlene Howard. She's an events coordinator at University Advancement. And she did <coughs> excellent work with us uh, on the provincial tour throughout this year. But her work with University Advancement is much appreciated. Next to her, Gail Shivak. Gail is a terrific, uh, very accomplished member of the University Advancement team. She's the Associate Director of Development and Corporate Relations. In that capacity, I've worked very closely with her over the years. She is a consummate professional and a great person to, to work with. To her right is Ivan Zichka. He is a relatively recent person to arrive in Saskatoon. We, uh, we brought him here from Memorial University of Newfoundland. He's the Associate Vice <coughs> President of Communications. He has already, I think, infused great uh, dynamism in our communications team at the, at the university. It's a very welcome addition to our team. Next to him, somebody I've worked with very closely over the years, Heather Magnitou. She is the Vice President of University Advancement. And uh, she has, uh, though originally from Saskatchewan, she happened to be down in Nova Scotia, St. Francis Xavier University, but made the appeal to her to return to the province. I said, you can be at the vanguard of the floods of former Saskatchewan people coming back and reclaiming your place in our province. And she did that. And she has that it is and has been a terrific colleague and uh, it's great to have you here as well. Heather, so that's the, uh, the University of Saskatchewan uh, team that's with me on this, uh, on this provincial tour. I'm not going to take a lot of your time today, but I thought I would give you at least a quick flavor of um, uh, a little bit of where I see the university world. My remarks uh, on the whole will be generic. I'll make specific reference, obviously, to the University of uh, Saskatchewan. Um, how many, how, how many of you have heard very recently, I'm talking about very recently, how many of you have, have, have heard universities referred to as ivory towers? I suspect not too often. It's a term that I think is receding into history. Uh, people don't speak of universities as ivory towers very often anymore because the idea of an ivory tower conveys the image of a place apart, doesn't it? 
place that's separate from our community. It's a place that's on the edge of it. It's on the periphery. It's not centrally part of our consciousness or of our lives. A place of is in Ivory Tower. I think the reason why the language is receding is because that image of universities is receding. receding. In the post-industrial knowledge society, knowledge economy, and we hear that language often, they become the buzzwords of our times in many respects. In the post-industrial knowledge society, universities are brought into the center of public life. And I think we've seen that in Canada. I think we've seen it elsewhere. Let me give you a few international examples. These are from places that I have traveled to that have connections, appreciable ones with our university in Saskatoon, in China. China a number of years ago, and I'm sitting next to the president of the Beijing Institute of Technology, which they regard as their MIT. It's a very, very fine uh, Beijing technical university, largely technical university. And the, uh, the, the president said to me, you know, we're going to build 100 of the best universities in the world in the 21st century. We call it our 211 program. And we're going to build 100 of the best universities in the world because we know that China will need those universities in order to be the leading country that we all expect it to be. Interesting. To be the leading country that we all expect it to be, we have to build 100 of the best universities in the world. Significant challenges, by the way. But nevertheless, uh, extraordinary determination on the part of the Chinese to do that. Why? Because again, in the knowledge infused society, in the knowledge economy, those universities, and universities had the unique role of being knowledge creators as well as knowledge transmitters. India, the ambition of India is extraordinary. The, uh, the government there has announced, and again, it's, <coughs> it's going to be a remarkable challenge, that India would like to incre increase the, the participation rates in universities from something under 10% to up around 30% by 2020. Now, try to imagine doing that in a country where you have nearly 40 million high school graduates a year. If you're going to increase the participation in post-secondary education from around 10 to around 30%, and you're going to try to accelerate that to the point that you're doing it by 2020, I, I, I can't imagine that they're going to be able to do it, by the way. But nevertheless, that's what they're going to try to do. And to do that, they know they're going to have to build not just a few universities, but by the way, hundreds of them or they're going to have to develop the kind of international partnerships that will allow them to do what they plan to do. Not so long ago, the now outgoing French President uh, Sarkozy lamented on behalf of France that there were not more French universities showing up in the Shanghai Index, which as you know is the index that's done each year of 500 of the 17,000 universities worldwide, the so-called uh, leading 500 universities. And Sarkozy was very distressed that more French universities were not included in this. He said, for France to be successful, we've got to have more of our universities. They already have very fine universities, cases, but we've got to have more of them in the very top category. Germany announced uh, 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 an initiative recently to try to do the same kind of thing. My point, of course, is that these are ambitions. They are high ambitions. They are global ambitions for countries to improve, and dramatically improve, and lead in the world of universities. Why? Because their importance in this economy, in this society, is widely acknowledged. In Canada, universities too, the public policy goals of the nation. Uh, we've always done that, of course, but I think the contributions now are more varied, they're more explicit, they're in many respects more demanding, Sometimes there are contradictory impulses in this world, but nevertheless, um, I think maybe universities are, are, are in a more prominent place now than we would see maybe 20 or even 10 years ago. And you, one of the expectations, of course, is that universities are expected to contribute to economic development more than ever. They're expected to contribute to economic development. The numbers alone of our universities means that they are large economic units Think of what the University of Regina means to this city, with its thousands upon thousands upon thousands of students and employees. I suspect it is the case that all in, you add in the students, the faculty, the research park, the associated enterprises of the University of Regina, that you would not be far off 20,000. 
that would be a very substantial part of the giant community. That, of course, is a very important economic factor in this city and a huge contributor to the economic as well as to the social and cultural life of Regina and indeed of Saskatchewan. <coughs> Similarly, in Saskatoon, in the city of 240, 250,000 people, more or less, the sheer scale of the university means that, uh, that it's a large economic unit in, in a mid sized city. Naturally, our, our major contributions are in the students that, uh, that we educate and who take their places in the society. One of the encouraging things from my perspective, it's not the case 10 or years ago, but to see the increasing numbers of these students who are saying, I'm going to build my career in the future in Saskatchewan. I um, actually have a lot of fun at convocation every year. I present certificates to students, and I usually conduct a little survey and find out which ones are staying in the province. I sometimes do it college by college and, uh, and decide, OK, this year I'm going to ask every engineering student what is her plan to be in the future, or every business student. And I have to tell you, it is enormously encouraging to see the percentages of our students who are saying, I see my future in the province of Saskatchewan. So that's uh, very good news. In the world of collaborative research as well, and here, university, industrial, government research, I think uh, that is getting a great deal of emphasis. Why? Because for the country to thrive, for its businesses to thrive, um, reliance on connections with the university, particularly in the areas not only of, uh, of hiring students, but of collaborative research is tremendously important. I want to say, by the way, that uh, this is not the really controversy. Uh, you will have read, you will have from time to time seen the suggestion that, well, possible for universities by going down this road, by moving out of the ivory tower into the center of the community, by its connections to industry, my heavens, aren't they getting too close? And will universities be able to protect and preserve their independence in an environment which is much more intensely collaborative than we have seen perhaps from time to time at least in the past? My own view is that uh, the, the, the current collaborative environment is a very welcome. I believe that universities are able to protect their autonomy if they're vigilant to protect their autonomy. They can, they can do the kinds of things that they need to do in partnership while at the same time preserving the, the initiative and the autonomy and the academic freedom of their academic uh, communities. Uh, my own view, by the way, said in Saskatoon many times, is that uh, contributing to economic development in this way is in a way in the DNA of the University of Saskatchewan. And to support that, I point to the fact that this is a university, it's the only one in the country that was founded on the pillars of two colleges, arts and science and agriculture. Arts and science and agriculture. Arts and science, of course, is a the importance of the historic, still and current liberal education, but agriculture to help build the province. The University of Saskatchewan's contributions to building the economic life of Saskatchewan in what for 50 years was its most important industry, still is a very important industry, and continue to be. The contribution over the years is absolutely tremendous. Uh, and just to cite one quick current example of that, our crop development center, the work that it has done in producing new crops, variants of crops, and uh, climate sensitivity uh, is, is, is fabulous. The pulse crop industry in Saskatchewan was not a significant industry 20, 25 years ago. It is today, it's a $1.8 billion industry on the way to becoming a $4 billion industry within a decade. And I think that if the head of the Pulse Crop Association was here speaking instead of me, he would say, as I would say to you, that that industry was really built through the partnership of the Crop Development Center, the University of Saskatchewan, and the Pulse Growers, the Pulse Industry. So, we're used to working in an environment in which we're asked to support economic development. We have a responsibility to do that in the province with the motive is 43% of the arable land in Canada. 43% of the arable land in Canada. When I first heard that, I didn't believe it. Then I googled the arable land in Canada, <laughs> and there it is, 43%. <laughs> so helping to build an agricultural industry in a province that's 43% of the arable land of, by geography, the second largest country in the world. Tremendous responsibility, tremendous opportunity to work together 
in the ways that I've described. So as I say, it's in our DNA. It's not something that I fear, it's something I welcome. We have to be careful and prudent in terms of protecting the, 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 the independence of the university in the ways in which it must be protected. But that, that's, that's relatively easily done, I believe. So that's my message, John, and I'm absolutely delighted to be here, the opportunity to share it with you, and the opportunity to address uh, any questions that your colleagues may have. But once again, thank you for inviting me, and thank you for inviting my colleagues to join you for this lunch. It's a most welcome invitation, and we appreciate it very much. Thank you, Peter. I think this might be coming from the developer, but I'm not sure. <laughs> Does the U of S have enough real estate to accommodate future building development for the long term? The answer to that question is uh, yes. Um, I think we've been very, very fortunate at the university. We have a couple of thousand acres in Saskatoon. We have large tracts of land elsewhere. Again, that's partly the agricultural connection of the university. Um, and indeed, for a very long time, much of that green belt in the east part of Saskatoon was devoted to uh, uh, experimental crops for the College of Agriculture. What we have done um, with our senior uh, group at the University of Saskatchewan is we led a process called the Vision 2057, in which we developed a plan for the 50-year use of our lands. And uh, we have, uh, we know we have lands that are available for uh, imminent or medium-term development. We have a lot of other land that we see as part of a longer-term endowment, which we wouldn't expect to see uh, uh, moved into develop a development stream, at least for the foreseeable future. But nevertheless, in terms of the projects that we've been doing, the latest is a very extensive residence project, three phases that will double our residence accommodation. Uh, U of R, by the way, had the vision to build, I think, two fantastic residences a number of years ago. And, and uh, we came a, a little late to the task, I think, uh, relying too long on the relatively inexpensive residential area in which the university was a part of. That's no longer the case. And so uh, we have to build residence space. Uh, we, we don't have, when we do a big project, we don't have to go out and assemble the land first or purchase the land. We're able to say, well, there's that wonderful tract of land. Uh, we call it the College Quarter between College Drive 14 and Preston and Cumberland. It's a large body of land. And we will be using that. And uh, I suspect uh, now, between now and five or 10 years from now, we'll be doing quite a bit of development there. So yes, we're very, very fortunate. Land is one of our assets. We want to use it responsibly, both to meet short-term needs, but to protect the long-term. Uh, we think uh, the endowment value of that land uh, and what it means and will mean in the future. What's the biggest risk that uh, the, the U.S. is facing, you think, Gary? I mean, it's, uh, things are all uh, uh, nice and uh, rosy now, as it were. But uh, is there a real challenge that the U.S. is facing? Well, I think one of the challenges that we face, and it's something that I live with, um, I don't mind saying uh, every day, and that is uh, the operating costs of major science facilities. That's a huge risk for us because we have two of the country's largest science facilities, the, the Canadian Light Source and the International Vaccine Centre, which is just under commissioning now, and it will be open probably in June. These are major national facilities. The operating costs are hard to assemble. There is no Canadian policy on the operating costs of what is seen to be strategic national infrastructure. Uh, as I pointed out many times, the operating costs of synchrotrons in the United States are paid, by the way, by the Department of Energy because they're seen to be as basic to science infrastructure as roads are to transportation. We don't have that same policy in Canada. We go out and assemble on a five-year basis. We go out to assemble the operating costs of these facilities, and there are no guarantees. And uh, we've been fortunate thus far. Um, and we've been fortunate in part because in the case of the Canadian Light Source, it has a track record of recent peer review since one of the best facilities of its kind in the world. And that has enabled us to knock on doors uh, successfully to get operating costs. But that could end very quickly. Uh, it would be a shame 
country serious about being the first world science country, you've got to have these facilities. But the University of Saskatchewan carries a very substantial risk associated with the ones that we have. So far, so good, but that's as far as I go. It's a great question. With that, thank you very, very much for all you've done for the province of Saskatchewan and in particular.